Thank you very much for joining me today with this presentation. My name is uh, Ömer Nizih Gerek and I'm from Eskişehir Technical University in Eskişehir, Turkey. Uh, I will be talking about uh, my personal experiences regarding a, a method to efficiently represent one-dimensional sensor signals, sensor outputs in two dimensions. Um, so let's start by making a separation, a distinction between a, a signal sensor and uh, the corresponding signal that it produces. The goal of a sensor or any sensor is uh, to convert a, an entity from the physical realm to an interpretable in information in the form of a signal. Uh, mostly the, uh, these sensors harvest electromagnetism and they mostly produce voltage levels, which we interpret in uh, time series. Um, and again, most of the sensors are discrete units, discrete in time that uh, takes the sensor readings in uh, periodic intervals of time, or they, there may be uh, separate discrete uh, sensors in the form of an array. And their output is just a rendition, and that's what we will be talking about today. It's quite an abstract topic, but the results will be very eminent and very solid. The sensor dimension and the signal dimensions are two different things. They may be the same, and usually they are the same. For example, for audio signals, we have uh, one sensor in the form of periodic sampling in time, and uh, it produces a one-dimensional audio signal. Or in digital photography, we have a two-dimensional sensor array, uh, which produces a two-dimensional signal in the form of an image. Or in videos, these two-dimensional signals are uh, acquired at uh, certain time intervals, producing a volumetric, a three-dimensional entity. So they correspond to the same dimension of the sensor and the uh, output signal. But sometimes the uh, sensor outputs and the corresponding output signal uh, dimensions are quite different. Hyperspectral satellite images are one case for that because they produce volumetric images, uh, the multiple images at different wavelengths, which corresponds to a three-dimensional entity, but uh, we just stack them together and then we say that it's one hyperspectral image and uh, that's usually converted into some interpretable uh, two-dimensional format. Or computer tomography is another example because we usually take uh, several one-dimensional readings in the form of an X-ray, one-dimensional X-rays of slices, and then we combine those slices to come up with a two-dimensional signal. Let me start by explaining the computer tomography, although it's not the topic of this particular presentation, it's a case. So uh, in computer tomography, we uh, take X-rays from a slice of your body at a, at a certain angle, and then we rotate those angles and the readings of the uh, one-dimensional uh, signals will become multiple. We will have multiples of such one-dimensional readings at different uh, rotation angles. And finally, we may just show those readings, one-dimensional readings, one after another, uh, as we see in this graph, where the left-hand side is a simulation phantom image and the right-hand side uh, columns are the readings that we have. But these readings at the right-hand side does not correspond to the image of the left-hand side. So we have to make a conversion and that conversion is usually known as the uh, inverse radon transform or uh, filter back projection algorithm, uh, where uh, we make mathematical operations to combine that information into two dimensional shape. So the uh, top left corner image is the uh, readings and the uh, bottom right corner is the corresponding two dimensional image that we may uh, construct. This is just an example. Another example is, uh, as I say, multispectral image or uh, multispectral uh, maybe a color image in RGB or hyperspectral of the satellite images, they are all multispectral, uh, but the multiple dimensions are different. And both of them are essentially three-dimensional entities, as we see, lots of two-dimensional images. But we usually combine them to come up with a two-dimensional overall uh, representation. For example, for the satellite images, this is the uh, interpretation where the left hand, left top is uh, the uh, corresponds to the unmowed pasture and the bottom uh, is the drying corn, uh, whatever it may be. So this is two-dimensional interpretation. 
Uh, but again, uh, since most of the native signal dimensions are um, readily available as the uh, sensor dimensions, for example, in audio signals, this is one dimensional output. In photographs, this is two dimensional. Voltage waveforms are two dimensional, or video signals are three dimensional. But sometimes when we focus to one dimensional cases, uh, when we zoom into that, we see that they may contain some portions where there's a periodicity. For example, this is the wall part of a, a one-dimensional signal. Uh, and as you see, it's repeating itself. Uh, th that is inspiring us about an idea uh, where we can mm, make use of that periodicity. Uh, the way that uh, we have proposed uh, in the study is to render these things in uh, stacks of uh, a period, like uh, you take one period and render it in the form of a row of a matrix, and then the second period as the second row, the third period as the third row, etc. And overall, we come up with a two-dimensional representation. This is the two-dimensional representation that I'm talking about. And uh, as we call it, uh, any image is born out of this uh, one-dimensional signal. The critical question is, why are we doing this? Is it efficient in the sense of analysis? Are we making sense of something? Are we uh, able to detect something out of the two-dimensional representation, which we cannot see in the one-dimensional case? Is it better in data compression? And uh, how can we really determine this uh, period? Is it, what happens if that period is changing sometimes, if it's not con constant? And uh, I will give you a few uh, examples from our own experience. And then uh, I'll try to explain why these uh, good experiences are encountered. Solar radiation is one of uh, the most obvious examples because solar radiation has a very a critical and pronounced period of one day, right? 24 hours, <clears throat> because every day is, <clears throat> excuse me, 24 hours. And what you see on the screen is uh, the solar radiation increases at the noon time and decreases back uh, at the night time. Uh, this is a, a, an actual reading from uh, United Kingdom in 2005. The red thing that you probably see right now on the screen is uh, July 26th and the uh, blue dashed one, dash dot one is July 27. And uh, probably you cannot see that, the blue dashed uh, dot one, because the red one and that blue dashed one are almost the same. So since they are the same, uh, it's quite um, inefficient to represent them side by side in one dimension. Why are we not stacking them on top of one another to see something, to make a better modeling? A predictive modeling, which is this case, by the way, because when we see them uh, side by side in one dimension, this is what we see. It's quite a mess. But when we render them in two dimensions, now we come up with this kind of a, a totally um, meaningful representation. As you see, uh, the left part is uh, containing some lower heights. The right part is also containing lower parts because they correspond to winter times. And in the center, the, in the during the summer time. The, the peak solar radiation increases and the duration, the width of the uh, sunshine is also increased. So this is a, a, essentially a two-dimensional entity and it's very easy to model it that way. Look at the model at the left-hand side. That model uh, is very efficiently representing the whole phenomenon and it contains only three parameters, okay, in two dimensions. And the amount of error that we make, which is at the right-hand side, is quite uh, low as compared to the a three parameter model of a one dimensional entity of the one dimensional interpretation. So this uh, two dimensional uh, model is quite efficient. We can do a prediction uh, of uh, the next hour's uh, solar radiation from the uh, past hour and the previous day's current hour and the previous day's past hour, for example. In, in linear prediction corresponds to the first line of this uh, slide. And we can even do some uh, nonlinear kind of prediction using neural networks and things like that. And we came up with quite nice uh, results with these. Uh, and here is the result. The bottom one is a, uh, is a zoomed version of the two-dimensional model. And as you see, the model is in predictive coding, very efficiently uh, catching uh, the, the solar radiations. Uh, the, the, the dotted one is the measure, the real one, and the solid line is the predicted, and the prediction is very uh, accurately following the real phenomenon, which is quite impossible to obtain or quite difficult to obtain with low-parametered uh, um, one-dimensional models. 
Another example is uh, voltage waveform acquisition, sampling those voltage waveforms for power quality assessment, for detecting the power quality events. <clears throat> Similarly, um, our Turkish um, voltage line frequency is 50 hertz, and we make, for example, 10 kilohertz uh, sampling. And uh, at every period, we stack them uh, below the other one to formulate uh, an image that we see at the right hand side. The left part of the right hand side image corresponds to the surface plot, but the surface plot and the image correspond to the same thing. They are the same interpretations, just shown in a different way. And when we look at <clears throat> the, uh, the image form, we see that it's a little bit tilted. Does it mean something, for example? It means that the, the uh, voltage waveform is not exactly 50 hertz, but something else, a little bit different. And we can see uh, some very small, subtle lines on, at, uh, towards the top. Those lines are now visible. And by vertical high-pass filtering, they will become imminent. And that sag kind of uh, voltage quality event will be uh, detected very easily. Uh, so 2D methods are now available to us. We can do a half transformation for uh, defining the tilts, or we can do two-dimensional wavelet transforms to uh, uh, perform vertical and horizontal high-pass filtering to come up with the corresponding uh, features as we see here. The arcing folds and the sags are now visible. In the one-dimensional uh, version, they, are, they were not uh, very much visible. Um, by the way, uh, th this is also very suitable for compression. Uh, it gives you the, the two-dimensional interpretation gives us two decibels of signal-to-noise ratio improvement at the same uh, um, compression ratio. Uh, and by the way, uh, this, this uh, thing um, corresponds to a line frequency of 49.9996 hertz, which is impossible uh, or very difficult to detect with one dimensional FFT based methods, for example. But when you measure this inclination angle, you will immediately detect it from trigonometric uh, formulations. And uh, this is, uh, again, a similar example where we can see some uh, interharmonics marked in uh, or indicated in these red uh, lines over there. And at the right hand side, uh, the interharmonics are quite visible in the image, but in the, in the time signal, they are very difficult to, to see, to make an observation, to make a measurement out of these things. So two dimension really works. Another place where two dimension <coughs> works is the, um, electric energy consumption data or the load data as we know of. The left-hand side image is the one-dimensional rendition. We can still see something over there, but it doesn't give us the resolution of hours or, and things like that. It just gives, you, it gives us a very coarse um, trend towards an increase. But when we convert it into two dimensions, at the right top, we see the data itself, which is easily a model using a two-dimensional and low parameter model that we see at the bottom right. The, the increase is still visible, but the resolution is quite fascinating. Um, so with that, by the way, we can make very long-term, but very high resolution, uh, like hourly prediction, uh, the two years after, etc. And the last case is the uh, ECG electrocardiograph, where now the, the periods are not very uh, clearly determined, clearly defined, because our heart, heart pulsation changes uh, in time slightly. So we have to detect those periods and then stack them below one another. But this representation is so useful that most of the practicing uh, doctors uh, are essentially using this kind of a visualization to see if there's something wrong uh, for, for in the biological sense. So this is also a, a very good idea to use, uh, the, the two-dimensional rendition. So why is the success is now the uh, final point. Each case seemingly has its own merits or reasons. But uh, the real reason is essentially uh, making long-term strong correlations, like multiples of periods which are very long, uh, far away in, in, in terms of the signal instance, uh, and convert them to short-term but two-dimensional correlations. So it's like uh, we have, um, let me show it from here. We have a, a period uh, which is a little bit long. Um, and A is one period away from D, B is one period away, away from E, etc. 
So when we look at the correlation uh, function Rx of um, k or whatever, we see that the, uh, the correlations are very far away. But when we bring them together like this uh, uh, way in the two-dimensional rendition, D is at the top of A and E is at the top of uh, B, F is at the top of D, etc. Uh, all of these very strongly related uh, items come together, and that makes a, a very large capital N version of Rx of N, Rx of capital N, converted into Rx of K and L, where K and L are very small. And the covariance dimension or the correlation dimension therefore becomes uh, capital, uh, sorry, uh, R times R, which is a small uh, covariance dimension as compared to R times capital N times R times capital N, which was necessary uh, to exploit uh, in one dimension. In the, but that corresponds to the linear case explanation. In the nonlinear case, there are infinitely many possibilities. Uh, we, we can uh, measure the uh, angle of the inclination. We can uh, look at the half transforms and we can look at the vertical high pass filtering, all of those things are available to us. So uh, in order to check for those availabilities, you may want to look for other cases uh, for periodic or quasi-periodic cases. For example, wind speed may also be an example because uh, although <clears throat> it's very much random looking, essentially every day at the same hour, we usually come up with wind. So a, a, <clears throat> a period of uh, 24 hours is still possible for wind speed modeling maybe. And how about three dimensional? If we can proceed to two dimensions, why don't we stack the two dimensional images side by side and make a three dimensional volumetric data, which may even further improve the efficiency. We all need to take a look at those things. So that concludes my speech. Thank you.